Um, it's so nice to be here today. It's really an honor and a privilege to travel from New York State here to Sri Lanka and to learn about your apparel industry here um, in this country. And I'm really pleased to be able to share with you some of the work that we're doing at Cornell University, which may seem in some ways not entirely directly related to apparel production. I'm going to be speaking today about fashion history, about the way that we archive fashion history and how we curate it into public exhibitions so that we can share a little bit with the wider public about the importance of fashion, what it means to our individual identities, our shared cultural identities, and our divergent identities as well. Um, so I teach at Cornell. I'm in, uh, in the department of what is called human-centered design in the College of Human Ecology. I teach in our fashion design and management program where we have three majors for bachelors of science, a major in fashion design, a major in fashion design management, and a major in fiber science. And so we bring all of those areas together as we think about fashion history and the way that we document it um, in our archive at Cornell. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that today as well. So my outline for the presentation today, first I'll be speaking about fashion anthropology. Um, often these two words uh, aren't used together, and I have a PhD in anthropology and sociocultural anthropology. I'll speak a little bit about what fashion has to do with the study of people and culture. Um, next, I'll talk about fashion curation, what exactly we mean by fashion curation. Uh, in the United States, Europe, and other places, there's been a proliferation of big blockbuster fashion exhibitions at museums, especially over the last 20 years. And we're seeing this as one of the biggest draws into art museums today. We'll talk about that. Um, and then I'll uh, talk about the exhibition of fashion in universities um, and how the hallway, uh, a space that we often kind of disregard as a, a space of transit, is actually a space of possibility for fashion education. Um, I'll talk about the history of fashion at Cornell and also uh, the history of the Cornell Fashion and Textile Collection, which I direct. Um, we'll do a virtual tour at the end of a select uh, number of our recent exhibits and I'll tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the future. So first, what is fashion anthropology? If we take these two fields separately, we know that anthropology is the study of human beings, the way that culture is both produced, how it's transformed, and how culture is performed on an everyday basis. And we know that culture is something that we learn. We learn it through um, shared and patterned uh, experiences. We know that culture is meaningful. And of course, fashion is one way that we're able to learn and express every day um, our culture. Um, fashion, on the other hand, it's something that is place-based. Uh, it's something embodied. It's also digital uh, these days as well. And importantly, fashion makes connections. It connects us uh, from the local to the global. Um, it makes connections between individuals and collectives, our communities that we're part of. It makes connections between production, what, what is made to be worn, and then how it's consumed. Uh, and it also creates connections between aesthetics, the visual, the design aspects, and the identities that we um, bring into the world every day. Fashion is both a noun and a verb. It's something that we do, um, and it's also something that exists tangibly and materially in, in the world. Um, every single day, we make a choice about what to wear, and at the same time, we're operating within certain restrictions. For example, the regulation of wearing a mask. So there are some choices about what you get to wear, and there are also um, a lack of choice at the same time. So this is what we call in anthropology the, the structure and agency debate, the choice and also the structures that um, often dictate what those choices might be. So in fashion anthropology, um, we're asserting that fashion is actually we're, we're combating this myth that fashion exists only in the West, that it's this Euro-modern phenomenon 
But instead, um, we argue as fashion anthropologists that fashion is a humanistic phenomenon. Um, and it takes place all over the world in cultures and communities, large and small, in rural communities, as well as urban. Um, and we always think about context when we're thinking about uh, how fashion works on an anthropological scale. We think about the economic systems that enable the production and consumption of fashion, also the regulations, trade policy, different laws. Um, social organization is really important too. You know, how you dress based on your age or class or other aspects of identity. And there are also ecological and material forces. So how fibers, for example, fiber science is such an important part. Certain fibers are going to affect, right, whether you're sweating or not. Some clothes make you sweat more. Some clothes maybe are more breathable. And there's a whole range of embodied experiences that are shaped by the actual materials themselves. In fashion anthropology, we also acknowledge that all knowledge is situated and partial. So what we mean by that is, as a researcher, you're bringing your own identity to bear on the subjects that you're studying. Um, and so we have to reflect critically about our, our position as the researcher and how that shapes uh, the questions we ask um, and how we come to uh, the topics that we study. And in anthropology, we use a particular research method called ethnography. And this involves um, getting to know people, talking to people, immersing oneself in a culture. Uh, and we also use a lot of archival and material-based methods. So we go into archives, we look at primary sources, we look at extant objects, materials, artifacts, and we start to piece together a kind of history that provides context for understanding why people are wearing what they're wearing today. So both past, present, and maybe even anticipating something of the future. And of course, in fashion anthropology, we convey our research through many different forms. Um, you know, typically when we think about academics, we think about the books that they write. Uh, and certainly that is a big part of what we do as academics, but <clears throat> I'm a creative uh, designer as well. So while I do write books and articles, I also think it's really important that we're able to convey our research in material, in visual, and other kinds of forms. So things like documentary film or creative design practice. And what I'll be talking with you about today is what I think is, has the most exciting potential for conveying anthropological research about dress, and that is curated fashion exhibitions, where we actually put on display actual garments, extant garments. They may be 100 years old, 200 years old. They might just be a day old. Maybe they've never been worn before, but we're using the real material artifacts to tell a story about a culture, a place, or a time. So what is curation? So in uh, the Latin root of curation means literally to care for. So when we talk about curation, we're talking about caring for something. And uh, the noun curator comes from medieval Latin and actually means one responsible for the care of souls. Um, and so the, the of souls is intimated here, but there's a, a really important aspect of this when we think about clothing, right? Because clothing is part of somebody's life. It's been lived by a, a soul, right? And so there's a certain amount of care that must be taken um, when we think about the root of these words. So in a way, we're all curators in our everyday lives. You are a curator of your own closet. You've decided what is in your closet. You care for those clothes, laundering, ironing, mending. Um, you move through different uh, garments over the course of your life. But you care for those materials in a, in a special way. But you're also a curator more broadly, right, of the relationships in your everyday life. You care for not only the materials, but the people in your life as well. So when we think specifically about fashion curation, um, I would argue that there are two main components of fashion curation. And these are first, stewardship. Um, and stewardship is really the collecting and care for extant or surviving fashion-related materials. So these might be historical, uh, they may come from another part of the world, and they may be a whole range of different materials. Fashion isn't just shirts, pants, dresses, garments. 
uh, but it's also the accessories that we combine with those garments. Um, it's the shoes, the jewelry, anything else that we wear on our body, and arguably even body modifications, right, like tattooing or piercing or other ways in which we might diet, exercise, shape the body, manipulate the body. These are all parts how we do our hair. That's all part of fashion. Some of those things are much harder to collect in a fashion collection. You can't exactly uh, collect all of these um, embodied aspects of the way that fashion is animated, but we can collect and care for uh, the material component. So stewardship is really about that care. Um, and so we must also, a part of stewardship is not only ensuring that these materials are going to survive in the long term, this means ensuring that they're in acid-free tissue, in boxes, out of light. We know UV is going to degrade textiles and other materials. Um, we want to make sure the care for those objects and ensure they're in best as possible, a climate-controlled environment. Um, but we also need to do research into each artifact that we collect. If we have something in a fashion collection and we don't know its history, there's a loss there. And so part of our work is either reconstructing the history or ensuring that the things we collect have very good provenance. In other words, the, how they've come to us, we know who wore them um, and we know a little bit of that history. The other part of fashion curation uh, is kind of the fun side of it, right, is the actual public exhibitions. How can we put these materials, oh, sorry, one more, commitment to preservation long term, which I just talked about. Um, and then in public exhibition, we want to take these materials and tell a story with them to the public. Um, so it might be a story about a particular culture or a fashion designer. There are a lot of fashion exhibitions that focus on the, the solo fashion designer, retrospectives. Um, but there also might be exhibitions on particular topics that are of important uh, cultural relevance at a moment in time. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we've done at Cornell um, to really capture more thematic exhibitions. We really want to bring these materials into public conversation. And so art museums, of course, people go to art museums, they value art. Uh, and fashion, arguably, is itself a really important art form. It's also a cultural form. It is a form of cultural expression. And that's why bringing the anthropological component together with the artistic material, everyday embodied fashion is where I think um, the fashion exhibition has a lot to offer contemporary society. When we exhibit fashion, uh, we're faced with a number of challenges. One is that we have to put the garments on mannequins. And so much of what makes fashion powerful is the way that a living body animates it. So there are some really interesting challenges. Um, and I think, though, with challenge always comes possibility for experimentation as well. These are some images from fashion exhibitions um, at Cornell. You saw at the beginning uh, slide, uh, this was the image I had on the very, very first slide. This is one of our exhibition spaces at Cornell that's located in the hallway. Um, so at Cornell, and again, this is perhaps not the, as common, right, when we think about major art museums, they're not exhibiting in hallways. But you're all university or, uh, you know, students studying um, in a fashion program. And so the hallway is a space that we can use uh, to share with our students as well as the public the kinds of work that we're doing. So we exhibit at Cornell in our hallway. Uh, this all, when I first came to Cornell, I was a little bit frustrated by this because there's a certain amount of uh, constraint to the hallway as a space. Uh, when you have a big gallery, you can have much larger, you know, pieces on display. There's a lot more flexibility in terms of how they look. Um, and the hallway is a little bit more confined. But um, as Kate Marshall has argued in her book Corridor, uh, Media Architectures in American Fiction, she says, for a hallway's representativeness is as a communication space. So what does that mean? Um, and what I think about when I think about hallways and corridors is that they are what um, Mary Louise Pratt has argued is a kind of contact zone. Um, these are, uh, she says, and this is to quote her, social spaces where cultures meet, 
they clash, they grapple with one another, um, often in contexts of highly asymmetrical relations of power. And so the, the hallway can be this space of possibility where you can have cultures come and meet and understand, come to think maybe differently about the things that they see. James Clifford, who is an anthropologist, then took uh, this concept of the contact zone from Mary Louise Pratt uh, to think about the idea of the museum itself as a contact zone. Um, the collection becomes, he argues, an ongoing historical, political, moral relationship, a power charge set of exchanges, of push and pull. And so what both of these theorists are thinking about is the way that the hallway is a, a site of tension, but that tension can be really productive when we're faced with ideas we may not agree with or um, learning about something that is unfamiliar to us, that there is a possibility for greater um, education. And so we're going to go a little bit back in time. I'll give you some of the context for where I work, um, which is in the College of Human Ecology, which began in the year 1900 as a program in home economics at Cornell. And in fact, it wasn't even a program yet in 1900. It began with this tiny little desk in a basement um, of Morrill Hall. And a woman named Martha Van Rensselaer was hired by the president of Cornell to start a distance education program for rural women in New York State, women who were working on farms, who couldn't afford to come to university, who needed to be at home with their families, caring for their work in the home, their children, et cetera. So she started a distance program. So it was a written back and forth kind of program. And by 1906, it grew to uh, over 4,000 students. And by that point, Cornell said, I think we're on to something here. There are a lot of women in New York State that are interested in studying home economics. They hired Flora Rose, who had just completed her graduate work at Kansas State. And together, Martha Van Rensselaer and Flora Rose founded a, a program and then a department in home economics at Cornell. Home economics, of course, includes things like nutrition, uh, family studies, and clothing and textiles, interior design, and these kinds of fields. Flora and Martha were also very well connected um, in New York State with a number of very important women. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt is just uh, two in there from the left. And so they worked with a lot of um, women who were involved in su the suffrage movement at the time in the 19-teens. This is an image of the League of Women Voters right after women got the right to vote in, New in uh, the United States. Um, and so they worked together with larger groups of women to really bolster this program. And by 1925, it became its own college. In 1915, uh, Flora and Martha uh, hired the first full-time faculty member in clothing and textiles, and her name was Beulah Blackmore. Um, we actually have the dress in our collection that she wore to her interview, which she made herself. Uh, she had a pretty wild style. These are some of the other garments um, in her personal collection, which she later donated to the fashion collection. Uh, this one from the 1920s, I think, is, is really quite beautiful. But what Blackmore did is she began a fashion design program at Cornell, and that was founded in 1915. This is one of the early clothing and textile laboratories at the time, um, and here's another from about 1920. Blackmore also began the collection, the Cornell Fashion and Textile Collection, as a teaching collection because in 1915 there wasn't PowerPoint, <laughs> there wasn't the internet, and so she needed to illustrate her lectures. And she figured that using actual material artifacts would be one way to teach her students. And so she began working with her students to display these materials, to tell stories with these materials in the hallways. Um, this is one of my favorites. I don't know if you can uh, quite read this slide, but this is a, a display of garments that students had created um, from men's shirts that had been stained and sort of ruined beyond repair. Um, and so they refashioned them. So it was an early form of upcycling that was, you know, they were doing this in 1915. It's a really hot topic in, in the US right now. And I think there's a lot of really interesting things happening here in Sri Lanka as well with the, the waste product, you know, the cutoff waste or um, products that, you know, orders canceled, how to refashion things into something new. And this is something we've been doing at Cornell for a long time. 
But Blackmer also curated small exhibitions to teach students about fashion history. This one was called Clothes of a Century. Um, here we have another uh, uh, part of the exhibit from Clothes of a Century. Um, and so she, again, she was using these materials to teach her students about the history of mostly Euro-American fashion. But she also um, began to work with students to curate displays in exhibition cases. Um, and a number of students came from all over the world, uh, e even as early in this early part of the 20th century. Um, and so I'm going to step back from this history um, and step into actually our current exhibition at Cornell which is um, a fashion exhibition that we have on display right now called Engaging Communities, Empowering Students, Fostering Cross-Cultural Connections Through Dress, 1936 to 1958. This is an exhibition curated by two PhD students, in our, um, one in our department, Linda Zapolius, and another, Emily Hayfleck, who is a, an anthropology PhD student. And what they wanted to explore was the way that international students in particular helped to diversify Cornell's fashion and textile collection, but also to diversify the dress that appeared on campus. Um, and they did this by focusing on specific students um, and the places that they came from in the world. Um, these are some of their exhibit posters. And um, I'll take you just quickly through the display that they put together. So this is, if you were to travel to Ithaca, New York right now, you would actually see this exhibit on display. So the first section of the exhibit looks at the way um, Beulah Blackmore, our, our first uh, curator of the fashion collection, how she began collecting dress both on campus and off campus. How she worked with students um, to collect things from their, um, from their homes, from their culture, but also worked with students who had graduated and went on to become missionaries. Um, or other, others who traveled internationally to collect pieces to bring back. So we have examples here from Myanmar on the far left, um, from China, and then on the far right is a, a piece from Pakistan that was given by one of the students. And at the same time, Blackmore realized that she needed to do more work to ensure that the collection was actually representative of um, cultures across the globe, not just what was happening in American fashion, not just what was happening in European fashion, but again, coming back to the, the, the approach, the anthropological approach to fashion, she believed that fashion existed in cultures across the globe, and so she wanted to collect examples of fashion from different regions. So in 1936, she got her sabbatical, she used her sabbatical uh, to travel around the world for six months, um, not by airplane, <laughs> by boat. Um, and so she went all over the world. You can see this image here is a, a photo of her in Cairo on a camel. Um, and then when she returned, she collected examples of dress from all of the places that she visited. And she came back to the university and actually curated a, a show called Costumes from Many Lands. But the important part of the collection, especially at this time in the early 20th century, was that it was intended to be used by students in their education. So not only to illustrate fashion history, not only to illustrate what people were wearing in different parts of the world, but also to be used as a source of inspiration and information. So when you look at a garment, turn it inside out, see how it's constructed, you learn a lot. Um, you can only learn so much by me talking to you and abstractly looking at images, but when you're actually handling something, you can see exactly how it's put together and learn a little bit more um, that way. So the next part of the exhibit looks at the way the, um, ex the collection was used in the classroom. So this photograph uh, that you see here is a student wearing an original design. It was a design that she created in 1946 that was inspired by the kipau um, that you see in the middle. There's a more modern kipau, the purple one, and the more traditional one on the far right, which you may remember from this middle slide. I think I have a pointer, maybe not. It's um, right in the center there. That's the same kipau. So uh, this example of, again, a student using the collection to take inspiration and to reimagine and create um, new garments. 
She also, as I mentioned, um, brought the collection to the public through an exhibition called Costumes from Many Lands. At this time, and really up until I think about the 1970s, it was relatively common for fashion exhibitions uh, not to use mannequins. Now, this isn't today, this isn't considered uh, proper museum practice. We would not put our garments on a human body anymore because of the you know, oils and the sweat and the way in which the body moves. You can easily rip something. Um, but it was pretty common practice at this time in the 30s, and so she actually put on an exhibition of these costumes, and about 3,000 people attended during what was called Farm and Home Week at the time. The next part of the exhibit looks at how students self-fashioned, how international students at Cornell um, modified their traditional dress to manage in, for example, the Ithaca climate. Right now it's about negative 20. Um, and so um, Anjani Mehta, who is here on the right, she was class of 1947, uh, she's combined her sari with a cable knit sweater underneath instead of the more traditional choli because it's really cold in Ithaca. And so thinking about how um, hybrid styles emerged, um, this is a newspaper article that was from the, the college paper about um, students on campus wearing saris. And so uh, students would bring their tradition, their traditional dress, their own fashions from their homes to campus, and there would be a really interesting kind of cultural exchange that would happen. Now we're going to go a little bit further back in time to 2015 um, to the first exhibit. So this interest um, in what Cornell students war on campus at different times. This has kind of been a theme in the work that we've done. One of the things that we've um, endeavored to collect over time are garments that students wear on campus. Because our collection, while it's um, important to document fashions from around the world, we're also really interested in the history of place. Um, the, our history uh, as the Cornell campus, the Cornell campus community, and so when I arrived at Cornell in uh, fall 2014, we were getting ready for what was called the sesquicentennial. Um, really try to say that three times fast, it's really hard. Cornell sesquicentennial, which is 150 years, is a sesquicentennial. Um, and so my students decided to curate an exhibition uh, about 150 years of Cornell student fashion. So what did Cornell students wear in 1865? Uh, all the way up to what they were wearing in 2015. You can see some of the students uh, in this image getting things prepared uh, for the exhibition. And working with students is a really important part of what we do. Um, training students how to handle artifacts, even how to do some conservation and repair work um, is, is something that we do in the collection. But the curation process is really, I think, what brings a lot of joy and inspires uh, the interest in doing historical research because you can dive very deeply into the artifacts and unearth their stories and then begin to tell some of those stories through the curated display. So this is our, um, uh, you know, our, our work room and so you can see myself and some of my students working together to think through uh, various garments, deciding what might make it into the case, what makes the cut, what doesn't, and so on. So an important part of what we do in our fashion exhibitions is we try to tell stories that are both local and global, but that have some connection to the place that we are a part of. Um, and so whether that's uh, exhibitions about Cornell students, whether they're Cornell students that have come from abroad or um, are from New York State, but also about the place where we live which is Ithaca, New York. You've probably maybe never heard of it. We're about four and a half hours north of New York City. We live in a region that is very beautiful. It is carved away by glaciers that receded after the Ice Age. And as a result, we have these very dramatic gorges and waterfalls that cut through the landscape um, and then end in this lake uh, right at the, the bottom uh, of our town. And this place inspired early filmmakers in the 19 teens, before we have, you know, synchronized sound, early silent filmmakers actually came to Ithaca to create films. It was the Hollywood before Hollywood. Um, and so we did an exhibition called The Biggest Little Fashion City, Ithaca and Silent Film Style, 
that looked at this brief moment when we could have been Hollywood, uh, but of course everyone went to California where the weather is a bit better. But it was this dramatic landscape that really drew early filmmakers. And the early filmmakers that came to Ithaca were the Wharton brothers, uh, Leo and Theo, who came in 1914 and set up a studio in what is now called Stewart Park, which is at the um, end of Cayuga Lake, that, that lake that all of the gorges um, you know, flow into. So Ithaca, of course, I mentioned is this very dramatic landscape, but the other advantage of Ithaca was that there were a lot of students around, and students make for great extras in films. Um, and so the image on the bottom is actually right in the middle of our arts quad on campus. Uh, and so we use this exhibition to tell the story of early filmmaking in Ithaca, but also to tell the story of fashion um, in silent film. So this is sort of an entry into the exhibition space. Uh, the Wharton brothers, uh, we, have a, we had a whole panel here explaining the history of the Wharton Studio Museum. And then the other entry point of our exhibition, this long hallway case, provided a kind of timeline for fashion history during the heyday of silent film, which is typically considered to be about 1910 to 1929. By the end of the 1920s, you have synchronized sound and the talkies come in. We highlighted a number of, um, of actors and actresses that were either living, working, or had some relation to Ithaca and silent film. So this is a, a dress that was worn by Minnie Mattern Fisk, who was not only uh, acted in silent films, but was actually much more known for her work in theater. Um, and the dress on the far right um, is part of our collection and is a beautiful garment that she wore. We also use this case to talk about the important fashion designers of the day. Early silent film this predates uh, costume departments in films. Nowadays, you have a costume designer listed uh, on the film. But early days, if the, if the actress was dressing as a modern woman of the day, she was really responsible for her own wardrobe. So fashion designers sought out these silent film actresses to do product placement, to ensure that their garments were on set and worn um, in these films. And so Paul Poiré um, and Lucille or Lady Duff Gordon were really important um, fashion designers who made sure that their pieces were on the film sets um, and worked really closely with a number of important actresses of the period. One of the um, films that was made in Ithaca was actually a serial. So silent serials uh, were very popular. A serial is an episodic series, kind of like Netflix today. They would be about two reels long, maybe 20 minutes in length, typically ended with a cliffhanger, and then two weeks later, you'd come back to the theater to see the next episode. Um, the, the biggest uh, serial of, of the day, or so it was uh, claimed to be, was a serial called Patria. It was a World War I preparedness film starring Mrs. Vernon Castle, or Irene Castle, um, and she lived and worked in Ithaca, and later um, married uh, Robert Treeman, who was from Ithaca and stayed in the region for a little while. She was also considered in the United States to be the best dressed woman in America. Um, and so as part of this exhibition, we went deep into the archives. We actually sought out and found her granddaughter, who had all of these amazing photo albums in her personal archive, which she later donated to Cornell. They're now part of our um, Division of Rare and Manuscripts collection in the library. And so we were able to see how Irene Castle, from a very early age, was interested in fashion, in theatricality, um, and how she had a desire to be very, you know, different in terms of her dress, to innovate and market it. She's considered to be the first woman in America to bob her hair um, in uh, about 1913. Um, and she also created you know, lots of different fashion items, like the castle band, which would hold her hair in place. Uh, and she ascended to fame with, in, in collaboration with her first husband, Vernon Castle. They were known for the castle walk. They were modern dancers. Um, and so they, they came to fame that way. And they were also very much interested in working with companies and doing various kinds of um, product placement. So they were in magazines like Vogue and Harper's, 
Um, and they also wrote a book called Modern Dancing. And interestingly, in this book, there's an entire chapter on dress reform. Um, where Irene Castle argues that the corset needs to be abandoned in order for women to be able to dance more freely and to get that kind of exercise. And she says um, in the book, you too could be slim and healthy and in love if you danced. So she and Vernon starred in a silent film called The Whirl of Life in 1915, and they began to experiment with all kinds of fashion products that they placed in the films and promoted. So she was both an astute businesswoman, but also interested in, in fashion. Um, so this is an example of a, a, a new technology um, in shoes for dancing with an elastic strap. Um, she also uh, brought over a tiny dog from Paris when they were in Europe in 1912 called the Brussels Griffon. It's, it looks like a little um, tiny Chewbacca type dog. Uh, and she often would carry it with her almost like a fashion accessory, um, one might say. And even though she railed against corsets, she was not opposed to taking money from the Redfern Corset Company to endorse, uh, endorse their corsets as well. And she worked with a lot of textile companies. Um, the dress that you're looking at here in the bottom left was designed by Lucille, the designer I mentioned earlier. It's actually surviving. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Costume Institute. Um, on the right is a Mallison uh, and Company silk company. So again, she's modeling for all of these different textile companies and making, of course, the pages of Vogue. She names her styles with her name, so she became uh, known for her short haircut, which was the castle bob. Um, but if you didn't want to have to cut your hair into this trend, because obviously hair grows a lot slower than fashions change, um, you could buy a wig and tie up your hair and wear instead this uh, wig from the uh, National Hair Goods Company. So there are all kinds of interesting um, products. She would also reenact some of these important fashion moments in the film. Oh, this is, let's see if I can make this go. Uh, this is her in Patria, just about to do the haircut. There's a little bit of a jump cut there, but um, representing these important transformative fashion moments on film. And in this clip, she's wearing the dress that you see on the right. Um, behind her are the Ziegfeld Follies, and this was filmed actually um, in New York City at the New Amsterdam Hotel. So you can see the fashion in these films. It's very dramatic. There's a lot of high contrast. Um, and this is because, of course, the, the films are in black and white. Um, silver nitrite really picked up on, on the glitter and the glitz. Um, and so she also promoted the sort of World War I aesthetic, the sort of militaristic look. Um, she's wearing here Vernon Castle's flight uh, jacket. Um, and this is just a, a, a clip. The Whartons were really interested in experimenting with split screen. Um, and so this is a, a tripart split screen uh, that they put together. So really innovative in terms of early film. Um, these are just more of the fashion photographs that we were able to archive from her granddaughter from these photo albums that she had. Uh, and here you can see again uh, just a little glimpse of what fashion looked like in motion. And what makes, I think, film really interesting is that it becomes the first medium, apart from everyday life, where you actually get to see fashion moving and see the same fashions circulating in theaters around, um, around the, the country and around the world. This is another dress by Lucille or Lady Duff Gordon that made it into Patria. She also used Patria to um, work with fashion designers to sell some of the designs that she wore on set. So this is a, um, a headdress that was designed for motoring um, or the Patria pom-pom, which was this, uh, the, the feathers at the front of this cap. And she worked with a fashion designer, Fabizy, in New York City again to model some of these uh, looks on set and then sell them in the pages of Vogue, Harper's, and others like The Delineator. But probably her most um, interesting collaboration was with a silk mill in Northampton, Massachusetts called Corticelli. Um, and with Corticelli, she developed a fabric called Satin Patria. So again, labeling many of these products with the title of the movie to do this kind of cross-promotion product placement. 
And the Corticelli Silk Mill, again, is, is a silk mill in Northampton. This was their logo. Um, and she ended up working with them for many, many years, launching a range of different fabrics um, that would appear in advertisements across many different uh, magazines where she would be able to show different products like the Castle Canteen, for example, that she's holding um, in the far right. Uh, this was, again, pieces that would show up in the films that then you would be able to purchase um, from uh, shops and stores and whatnot. And of course, this is the war era. So um, one of the things that the Corticelli Silk Mill would advertise is that it would be more patriotic to buy silk instead of wool because wool needed to be used um, for military uniforms. But Irene Castle was also very much interested in fashion design as well. And so she designed many of her own garments in addition to the things she wore designed by uh, Lucille and others. And she eventually worked with the Corticelli Silk Mill to launch her own fashion line. And so she becomes the first film star in the United States to have a self-named eponymous fashion line. And it was called Irene Castle Corticelli Fashions. And we were lucky enough in this fashion exhibition to have three examples from this collection that we were able to display. Two from our collection, and the one in the center is from Ohio State's uh, clothing, Historic Clothing and Textiles Museum. A number of other garments uh, we were also able to, sh to show that she wore. Um, and this image on the left uh, includes a cape, this beautiful gold lame cape. Um, and the outfit worn by her second husband, Robert Treeman. As well in the collection, we had this headdress that had been attributed to Irene Castle, but we weren't entirely sure if she actually had worn it. The, proven uh, the provenance wasn't uh, there to the degree I would have liked it, but then when we looked through those photo albums, we were able to find the photos of her actually wearing this headdress. Um, so this was one of the first exhibits that I uh, curated in collaboration with some folks locally from the Wharton Studio Museum to really bring this history forward um, into the community. And so as we think about local history, I also wanted to bring a more, uh, open it up to think about um, histories of, uh, of national histories as well, in addition to the more local history. Um, and so in 2017, we curated an exhibition about apparel manufacturing in the United States um, and focusing specifically on the unions that worked with um, the, the unions that advocated for production in the 20th century, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. And we were able to do this because Cornell is also home to the Kiel Center and the Kiel Center is an archive um, that is connected to the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Um, and at the Kiel Center, they have all of the records from the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, um, as well as the Amalgamated Clothing uh, Workers of America. And so in these archives, they have things like manuscripts and correspondence, photos, banners, slides, all kinds of things. Um, and so we're able to see things like union labels, um, we're able to look at the, the actual, uh, we were able to curate a display, the timeline um, of action and organization with the unions. Um, and you can see here some of the union banners and we created backdrops um, that were from the photos from these archives as well. We looked at different actions um, that the union did to try to advocate for or against different brands. So for example, there was a brand called Judy Bond. They made blouses um, and they were uh, what became known as a runaway shop. They started producing down south. So they had broke their contract with the union. And so the union started manufacturing these shopping bags uh, that said, you know, don't buy Judy Bond blouses and would hand them out at department stores. So they did some pretty radical things um, as well. So we were able to show some of that. Um, and then we also wanted to show uh, some of the fashion designers of the period who were designing and manufacturing important American designers who wanted to work with um, these various unions. So Calvin Klein on the far right and the image on uh, the far left is actually a, a dress by Stephen Burroughs who is known for this sort of lettuce leaf edging. The ILGWU also did a number of promotional films uh, that they, they used to try to 
um, help promote American fashion and to promote uh, specifically union-made American fashion. And so we digitized some of these um, Super 8 uh, film media. So as we move through here, you'll be able to see um, the kinds of promotional films that they created to, to, to show the quality of work that was produced in union shops in the United States. Um, so this is a film from the 1970s called Fashion in Action, uh, where they're focusing on these plaids. And you can see, right, the, the way in which that chevron, the plaids are matched really beautifully and perfectly. And so one way that they were trying to advocate for the apparel manufacturing industry in the States was by focusing on quality. Um, that quality could be achieved um, in the U.S. because, of course, there was so much offshoring happening to Hong Kong and other places at the time. They also tried to support emerging designers, so they created in the late 60s uh, and through the 70s into the early 80s an award called America's Next Great Designer Award. Um, so we highlighted that and some of the winners of that award. This was a, a, um, Belinda Hughes who won the award in 1981 and she went on to create a children's wear company. Um, and so we have pages from her scrapbook that we were able to show in the exhibition as well. And then, of course, the unions wanted to make um, union garments both fashionable but also recognizable as union made. So they did a whole labeling campaign where they put labels into the, into the product so that consumers would be able to see that something was union made. Um, and then we did a small display over at the Kiel Center, um, and in that display, we were able to show uh, a sort of a whole closet in different ways that the union label was promoted. And uh, we did an opening reception where we actually had, um, I, I don't think I have sound, but we had a one of our student acapella groups sang a song, which was part of a commercial campaign in the 70s and 80s called Look for the Union Label. Um, of course, uh, all of this effort was really did, didn't work <laughs> because only about 1% of uh, garments are manufactured in, a, in, a, in an American's closet are manufactured in, in the U.S. today. So despite all of the effort advocating for the union label with, you know, changing trade policy and the ability to have things manufactured in other parts of the world at a much lower cost, the emergence of fast fashion um, and all these other forces, uh, it, it, that, was, that was the end. So it was a, an interesting story to tell um, and to focus on that, that rise and the fall of unions in and apparel unions, garment worker unions in the 20th century. So we also have an exhibit website um, and you can visit that and read a little bit more. But this exhibit really helped us to try to think about bridging um, production, the production and consumption disconnect. So we talk about this a lot um, in the work that we do in, in our fashion program at Cornell, that there's this big disconnect, right, between production and consumption, that the consumer is not thinking about who is making the clothing. They're not thinking about what the clothing is necessarily made of or how that natural resource comes to be. And so the next exhibit that we did was a collaboration with, um, Cornell has a lab of ornithology where they focus on, on bird uh, research. And we have a museum of vertebrates. And we wanted to do an exhibit that looked at the history of fashion and feathers. So feathers as a really important source of both inspiration for designers, but also something that is um, exploited and uh, taken and expropriated from uh, these animals. And so we wanted to get people thinking about where clothes actually come from. So in the Fashion and Feathers exhibition, um, we look at inspiration and we look at exploitation, uh, knowing that there's a lot of overlap uh, between the two. Um, and so this is the first part of the exhibit where we actually showed garments that have feathers, actual feathers, um, and then we showed the study specimens from the, the Cornell University Museum of Vertebrates, the actual study specimens um, of the birds that those feathers come from. Um, this is sort of an intro uh, graphic that we used that had much more smaller accessories to show again birds as both inspiration to fashion designers and the exploitation of birds as well. 
So one of the birds that we wanted to tell a story about is um, a now extinct bird called the Carolina parakeet. It's the only um, parakeet as far north as where we live in New York State. And by the 19 teens, it had been hunted to extinction and used um, pretty widely in fashion at the time. One of the things we also wanted to think about is the way that when a feather is removed from a bird, you lose the face, right? It becomes abstracted. So you almost forget to think about the life of the being uh, that once lived. Um, so again, we had these large study specimens. This is a marabou stork um, alongside the garment that used feathers from that same animal. So the marabou stork, the downy feathers of the marabou stork, it's right at the bottom. Um, that's what's used in the, the bottom part of the white jacket. Um, on the right is a down jacket from Patagonia. When we think about abstraction, um, down, you don't even see it at all, right? It's, in, it's enclosed um, and quilted, but of course it is the most insulating material. So it has really important material properties that scientists still haven't been able to fully um, mimic in the, it, to the degree that down can provide warmth. Um, another bird that we looked at was the, um, this uh, chucker partridge. Um, which you can see the, the feathers there on the side, really distinct pattern. And again, looking at how um, when a feather is removed, it becomes abstracted. Um, but then when you include the whole bird, it's a little bit <laughs> kind of uh, creepy, right? So we have this hat on the right that's actually um, made from the entire partridge. But it was made by a milliner who works with, um, works with hunters who hunt for the meat and then she takes the skins and then creates them into these hats. So she's actually t trying to take a more sustainable approach, but it is a little intense to look at. Um, on the more fun side of things, we looked at birds as inspiration and organized the cases according to different textile design techniques, um, things like embroidery, which you can see on this fan. Um, we also have some embroidery in this case. Uh, and so again, this was a really fun exhibition. I want to make sure I check my time. We are about an hour in, so I'm going to try to move along pretty quickly. Um, since most of you here today are students, I wanted to spend a little more time talking about the way that we work with students in the collection. Probably one of my favorite exhibitions that we curated with our students was an exhibit called Women Empowered, Fashions from the Front Line. Um, and this was an exhibit curated by 12 students who wanted to think about the ways that fashion could empower and uplift women when they're doing the work on the front line. The front line, right, is defined as that place as close as you can get, you know, to your enemy, right, is the front line. So what are women wearing in spaces like that to transform themselves, their position to uplift and to make change in the world? So again, we went into the archives. Uh, we began to look at different materials um, that might tell some of these stories. Um, of course, this was an exhibit curated in 2018. Um, and so we were all thinking about the Women's March, which happened um, right after uh, Donald Trump had been elected. And so the way that women were speaking out against, um, against that election and the things that they wore. Um, and so here we displayed this amazing uh, American flag hijab that was actually created and designed by the creative director of Hot Hijab, which is a, um, an American uh, company out of New York that's the largest hijab manufacturer in the United States. Um, and we looked at spaces where women were making change through fashion. So things like in the government, right? Um, so here we looked at our representative, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She actually loaned us the shoes she wore when she was campaigning. Um, and so what you can see is that those shoes are entirely worn through on the bottom. Usually we don't display shoes with holes in them or garments with holes in them in a fashion exhibition, but the hole tells the story of hard work. She's on the front line, she's trying to get elected, she's walking door to door in her district to connect with her community and literally wore through the bottom of her shoes doing that campaigning work. Um, and she always wore this red lipstick too. So we, we wanted to show that interesting contrast and this is a photograph of her during that campaign. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a graduate of Cornell University and so we wrote to her, she's a, she was um, now deceased, but she was a Supreme Court Justice at the time 
She agreed to loan us her judicial collars. She was very known for wearing these extravagant judicial collars to make a statement on the bench. Um, and so we were able to tell her story in the way that she you know, called attention to herself um, in her work as a Supreme Court Justice. We also looked at the stage, um, different kinds of stages that women use to make change. So um, for example, we highlighted um, a woman named Sylvia Goldstaub, who was a mother who lost her son, um, who died of AIDS-related illness in 1988. And so she created this outfit covered in red ribbons. She wrote a book, and she used that as a stage, as a platform to speak out, to try to reduce AIDS stigma, um, and to encourage parents to continue to support their children if, if they became HIV positive. Um, we highlighted the story of Rachel Powell, who is a fashion designer who is um, really trying to convey both the African-American woman experience, but also speak out against sexual harassment. Um, and so this was a piece that she made, uh, a dress that she made that was about sexual assault. Um, and that was another one included. We also wanted to think about women in sports. So we focused on uh, Cornell is known for their women's hockey team. Uh, they were one of the first uh, universities to have a women's hockey team in the U.S. And so we um, had the first two uniforms worn by the two women who founded the hockey team. And then we finished it off with a contemporary jersey um, that was signed by um, many of the women who then played for Team Canada and won the gold uh, medal a few years back. And of course, we looked as well at uh, the university and so how in teaching and learning women use fashion um, to make change and what that symbolizes. So again, coming back to Flora and Martha, our college co-founders, they were very um, involved after World War I in rebuilding Belgium's libraries. Um, Flora Rose did work with children on nutrition, but Martha Van Rensselaer helped to rebuild the libraries in Belgium and these were some of the medals she received from the king and queen. And we also thought about women who worked in military service. Um, and this is a World War II uh, waves uniform. And of course, fashion in the everyday. Uh, T-shirts, um, as well as the hats worn to the Women's March, and celebratory fashion as well. So this is a, a pretty amazing piece that would be worn to pride parades um, to celebrate uh, freedom of sexuality. And so here we have the, um, the exhibit cases uh, with all of our visitors as well. We've also done some pretty like quick and dirty exhibitions um, during COVID. We weren't sure how long we'd have access to campus. We did a very quick exhibition called Green Armor. Um, and so we have a COVID dashboard and green is what we're always trying to go for, right? We have the green, yellow, red levels. So we did an exhibition about the color green. Um, which really got students into the collection to look at examples of garments that are the color green and what stories can we tell with that kind of aesthetic cohesion. And then the last um, that I'll talk about is uh, this exhibit that a number of students curated on texture. Um, so less political um, and more fun. So how can we um, think about the possibility of texture uh, in fashion? And so the students, made these really wonderful um, exhibition guidebooks because you can't touch museum artifacts and so seemed kind of cruel to, cr to curate an exhibit about texture and then not let people touch anything. So they actually made these exhibit booklets and put swatches in so you could actually feel the textures. They had warm and fuzzy, slinky and scaly, crisp and crinkly, uh, soft and squishy, um, and then most recently, our last student curated exhibit, um, again, during COVID, we managed to put this one together. It was called Fashion in Transit. And it looked at all the different ways that fashion enables the body to move from rolling, walking, sliding, orbiting, swimming, riding, flying, carrying. And then we did a small exhibit in the museum, um, the art museum on visualizing this kind of transit. So sliding, of course, we can think about things like ice skates, swimming, we looked at swimsuits, we looked at different ways that people could ride, whether it's train travel or um, by horseback. We also included this, um, ex this art garment. This is not an actually manufactured garment, but it's called the personal space dress. 
Um, and so when you're traveling on a subway, it actually helps create that six feet of uh, distance, so it expands. Uh, we were able to show um, shoes and the ways that shoes, particularly in the early 2000s, became a site of individual expression. We thought about um, various accessories that help the body move by rolling, so skateboards and roller skates, but also wheelchairs. That's a, a 19th century wheelchair that we were able to include. Um, and then flying. So what you're looking at in the middle there is a wingsuit uh, for base jumping or for skydiving. You can actually control the air a little bit. And then on the back of this Art Deco um, pajama top is a representation of a Zeppelin or a, a rigid um, air, uh, 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 which is one way, of course, to fly in the early 20th century. So our next exhibit, I'm going to end with this slide, is called Dressing the Circus. Um, so we're looking at circus apparel in our next exhibit. This will be curated by a PhD student named Jenny Lee Dupuy, who actually worked for Cirque du Soleil for about 10 years um, and is very connected with the circus community. And so she's going to be curating an exhibit about the history, the function, the labor issues, um, which you can see here. You have to move the body in very dramatic ways that you typically don't move in everyday life. And there's a, a lot of important safety considerations as well for this kind of apparel. So that is a little tour of what we do at Cornell, the kinds of exhibits we've curated. This is just touching on a few. We do about three exhibits a year. Um, and these are, are a few of my favorites that connect back to this theme of fashion, anthropology, and the way that culture, community, individual, and collective identities can be expressed through what we wear. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd be glad to take any questions. You might want to sip some water. Yeah, thank you. It's a lot of talking. <laughs> it takes a lecture to talk that way. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Green. So the um, floor is open for questions. I've, I've got a few that I have got uh, via the um, electronic channels. But before I go to that, I'd like to open up the floor for any questions here. May I ask a question of the students? Yes. <laughs> um, if you could curate a fashion exhibition, is there a theme that you feel like would be a really interesting and compelling theme for a fashion exhibit, a story that you feel like might be untold, that could be told with fashion artifacts, or an aesthetic, or a design idea. Um, I'm curious to hear from all of you if, you if there's an exhibit you'd love to curate in the future. Not to put you on the spot too much, but if any of you have any thoughts or ideas, I'd love to hear. Flow is open for anyone. We've got some of our <laughs> colleagues from uh, the yeah. center as well. That's a really great point. And one of the things that my students and I talked about when we were curating that exhibition is that that exhibit, just as you're saying, the, the women empowered fashions from the front line, you could curate that exhibit a thousand, a hundred thousand, a million different ways. And every person could curate it differently because there are so many stories to be told. And that was one of the greatest challenges of that exhibit was which stories do we pick to tell? Because of course there's the, the famous people, and, but we didn't, as much as that's like the big draw to bring people to the exhibit, 
it's really the stories every day of women who are working every single day, actual frontline workers, right? Nurses, but also mothers and, you know, and teachers and people who aren't famous but are really on the ground doing, doing that kind of work. And what are they wearing that helps them in, in the work that they do? So that's a really great answer. And, and one of our ideas, people kept asking us, oh, are you going to travel the exhibit? Will this exhibit travel to other communities? And, and we said, uh, no, but we'd love to travel the idea of the exhibit and have other communities each curate an, an exhibit with this theme amidst the, the fashions from where they're from. Um, so thank you for that comment. Our floor is also open for any of the students uh, who would like to take that on. Try to get the support. Yes. I can pass this on. Just introduce yourself and start the question. Hi, I'm Abhi Shana from Batch 33. So I would like to come up with some uh, fashion ideas if I need to do a uh, exhibition. So I'm thinking it would be great if you could uh, come up with all the ancient. A fashion era is we come and we consider about the Sri Lankan king's era and all those clothing and material and combining with today's latest fashion. That's, that is a brilliant idea. I love, I love that concept, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to think about the past and how the past and the present day are, are connecting, articulating and um, the way that we bring the past into the present through what we wear. That's a really wonderful idea. Um, maybe you can come to Cornell for your graduate degree and <laughs> curate the exhibit with us. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Mahali from the Batch. I also have a suggestion. I think uh, currently uh, there are no much uh, fashion options for different able people. Yes. And I think that's a good topic to speak about. That way it will be like, more influencing. And there are a lot of stories, especially uh, like people who were like, born there and then like, into accidents and things, they become different people. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, those will reveal a lot of stories and if you have a good background. That is also a wonderful idea. We had a few in the fashion and transit exhibition that I mentioned, we had a few pieces um, that in the walking part of the exhibition, for example, um, we had a shoe leveler um, for, for people with um, different leg lengths. Uh, and then we also had a, a garment, a, it was more of a functional garment that was made by a, a former student of ours with her research lab at Harvard um, her name is Vanessa Sanchez. She's Dr. Vanessa Sanchez now. She just finished her PhD. Um, but she and her team at Harvard had developed um, a kind of mechanotherapy, like a kind of a soft robotic exoskeleton that helped with deep leg, uh, deep vein thrombosis. Um, so different kinds of um, garments that will help the body move. Um, and that's why also we wanted to include the, the wheelchair and other kinds of uh, mobility devices. But thinking, I think you bring up an interesting point as well that it's not just about this kind of like a more medical device, but how is fashion coupled with that too? Because the fashion component is really important to be able to express oneself with fashion. And there's a lot of interesting work that's happening um, in the industry with uh, uh, brands like Tommy Hilfiger, Zappos, and others are developing um, accessible fashion lines. Um, so it's an exciting, uh, exciting area in the future, and I think that would be an excellent exhibition idea. Uh, any other thoughts? Anybody else? I'll possibly have time for one more idea before I jump into a few of the questions I've got. All right, so. Uh, Professor Green, so there's this question about, um, so this is from Puni Vikramasinghe. Unfortunately, uh, she's not here with us today, obviously, uh, for due to COVID issues. Uh, so she's joining us live uh, on FP. So she's asking, is there a relationship between fashion anthropology and sustainability in the modern context? Because sustainability is quite huge uh, when it comes to our industry. My colleagues here would uh, vouch for that. 
there are new, uh, new, new job opportunities that's uh, coming up uh, in that space in uh, apparel manufacturing. So what sort of link uh, do you see between these two? That's a question. Yes, I think there's a really important link. And I think one of the things that uh, excites me the most when I speak with my students at Cornell, this Gen Z, the Zoomers, they are very interested in sustainability. When I ask my students, what, you know, what part of fashion do you see yourself working? Where do you want to be? Almost every one of them, to a certain degree, is interested in sustainable interventions and solutions. And I think that this is um, a really important part of their generation, which is rooted in their collective, you know, the collective generational, um, culture. And so again, I think it's very much rooted in, and you know, when we talk again about anthropology, it's the study of people and culture and culture might be an ethnic identity, it might be a gender identity, but it also is age too. Age is part of um, your generation, your, your community as well. And so I think there's some exciting things happening with the with the Zoomer generation and their interest in sustainability. And I also think that on a, you know, on a larger scale, we are faced with the reality of global climate change and that things need to change. And that's why many of our exhibitions are really trying to bring to the public uh, the, the backstory of fashion. Who is making fashion? What is it made of? And what are the ethical um, considerations? Because again, when you go to the shop, to buy the garment, you get excited when you see it's for sale, and maybe you even brag to your friends, oh, I got this really good sale item. And you know, usually nobody questions it. It's a great thing, and of course it makes you feel good, but then there is a cost. There is a cost to that, that great deal that you got. And it actually isn't a great deal, probably, because along the way, people, planet, have been exploited to enable such kind of consumption. And so if we can bring attention through fashion exhibitions to the way things are made, who is making them, what are the conditions of the manufacturing, then we can perhaps um, bring greater awareness to these really important issues. And it's, I've been so inspired by what I've seen so far in my visits through Brandix um, and here in Sri Lanka. There are so many creative, sustainable solutions that I have seen that are not just being talked about, but actually put into practice in the work that's being done here. So I have a lot of hope, um, and I, I think it will continue to be a really important area, and I'm excited to see more as well with upcycling and reimagining how waste product might be used um, or reimagined into something useful. For example, we were talking earlier about the tea the tea hues, the tea dyes, the, the waste product of um, the iced tea industry, that waste product being reimagined into a dye that is going to reduce the carbon footprint of the production of, of cottons and nylons. It's really, that's just one small story, but there are so many other ways. Um, and you all are part of that future. And this is a really important creative um, challenge to meet. Uh, there are a couple of questions that are more of academic in nature, which I will hold back. <laughs> but there's an interesting question from our colleague at the back, Chamikara. Uh, that is, uh, with your study over the last so many years in terms of this anthropology, uh, what sort of trends do you predict in a post-pandemic era? Because all of us are used to wearing pajamas and doing our thing, yes. and this sort of clothing <laughs> is reserved for this sort of event that doesn't happen much. So how do you how do you sort of uh, if I ask you to make a prediction, uh, what what is it that you see? Well, I think that I do believe that history repeats itself, and so if we look at the last pandemic, the Spanish flu, what happened in the 1920s? It became wild. It was the Roaring Twenties. People were dressing extravagantly. They were going out. They were having big parties. I think that once we get on the other side of this pandemic, people are going to dress extravagantly and have so much joy and fun and finally being able to go out, be with friends and dress up because as much as it's, 
you know, nice to wear comfortable pajama bottoms and then your Zoom top <laughs> with your tie or whatever. Um, there's, you know, it, it gets a little monotonous after a while, and I think that people are craving the opportunity to dress up again. And so I predict that once we're on the other side of this pandemic, we are going to see a resurgence in elaborate, exciting fashion. I think it's heartening for all of us in the industry <laughs> uh, because it talks about continuation of what we do and for the students as well. There's hope, definitely. But on um, the other side of that, though, I in some ways have contradicted myself because that might be at odds with sustainability, right? So how can we dress extravagantly and, and with a lot of um, expression? And maybe it happens through more like DIY, nice. uh, do-it-yourself kind of embellishments or, or whatnot. But I think that that will also pose, perhaps my prediction is also going to pose a big you know, environmental sustainability challenge as well. Okay, we've got about five minutes, so uh, I'll open up the floor again. Anyone, uh, any one of you have any questions? Uh, why don't we start with him and then come to you? I'll start with you. Okay, there is some crazy idea about your generation education. Uh, you already talking about the past and the present ideas and the people who are uh, raising uh, and how they are raising. And uh, I would like to give some idea about uh, why do why don't you present something about the uh, future? Uh, you can do uh, something like uh, how current people think about the future. So oh, because yeah. uh, I have seen some uh, BBC uh, video, uh, the video shows uh, future world uh, in 19, uh, 1980. That is a very uh, uh, Exciting when people, uh, how people think about today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you can do something like that, uh, it is very enjoyable when uh, future people looking at uh, today. Yeah, that's a great idea. An, an exhibition about how we would imagine the future, what we imagine the future to be. Yes. Yeah, I, and you could even, I think, bring in some historical components to that. For example, like how people you were saying in 1980 imagined what fashion would be in the future. If you could find something to show in the past what people imagined and then today what people are imagining for the future, that's a great idea. Futurisms, we could call it. <laughs> there you go, futurisms. Can we hand over the mic, thanks. So I would uh, connect back to the sustainability and curation. The curation is uh, too careful, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a really excellent point. I think often uh, longevity, people aren't thinking about longevity so much when they're, they're thinking about, okay, how can we create the production process to be more sustainable? But really, the most sustainable thing would be a, a, a garment that lasts a very, very long time. Um, and the challenge with that is, how do you create a garment that lasts a long time but stays in fashion? This is an interesting challenge. But I think longevity is it's something I'm always, um, always thinking about. Maybe a garment that can be uh, reimagined or redesigned over time could be another kind of creative future. Imagining garments of the future might be, to me, I would, I would, I would imagine a garment that is designed to change.
I have time for one more question from the audience. Then I have a quick one that has been asked by uh, one of my design colleagues again, who's not here. So I'll end with that. But uh, any questions from the audience? I can take one more. Can I have? Yes, Gashi. Hi. Uh, I was just have a small question. Have there been any problems? Dress or the colors they use, have they influenced the normal people? The way the choices the normal women make have they influenced by the powerful women's dress code in past? Will it happen in the future or in the present? Does it still happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think to a degree, of course. Um, I think you know when we look to role models, for example, and I think many of these. Many of the women that we highlighted are, are you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and, and others who are in positions of power, and they serve as role models to women, young women, older women. Um, and as role models, when we look to our role models, we often try to emulate their behavior. And so I think, yes, certainly to a degree, there is uh, a way that that these women have influenced um, the everyday person. Uh, as well, but I also think you know it, it's not so like top down, and that everyday women are also influencing uh, those in power, even fashion designers. There's uh, there's this sort of uh, historical narrative that that design comes from the designer and trickles down to the everyday person, and I think you know to a degree maybe that's true, but there's also the way that the designers who are who are making these new products and ideas, they're taking their inspiration from the everyday person who is going to their closet, experimenting, creating a new look every day, and, um, and then that becomes something, some bit of inspiration. So Professor Green, I think uh, with your background, you're one of the most qualified people to answer this. Um, okay. Fairly a dichotomous question. How often does the fashion from the history is repeated? Is there a specific fashion? Uh, is there a specific pattern? Is there like a cyclical, but is there a time duration to it? Yeah, I think fashion historians have debated this um, for many, many years. So the, 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 the keeper of costumes at the Victorian Albert Museum, James Laver, uh, there's something you can Google it later uh, called Laver's Law. Okay. Um, and I think he might have developed this in, in the 30s. It's not really a law, but he, he has a sort of um, schema. So you know, one year ahead of its time, a garment is daring. Uh, in its time, it's chic. Uh, okay. Maybe I can't remember the exact numbers, but 20, 10 to 20 years after its time, it's amusing, uh, or two years after its time, it's dowdy, right? And and then 50, 100 years after its time, it becomes romantic, you know. And so when we think about cycles of fashion, um, for example, me, I was born in the mid 1980s, and so when I was growing up, that era always seemed really hilarious to me. The big hair, the big shoulders, like amusing. Um, and slowly we start to see things come back. And I feel like what I've noticed in my lifetime is it seems it's like a 20 to 30 year cycle that things start to okay. come back. We're starting to see like the early 90s uh, looks, or we have been seeing the early 90s looks coming back now. So we're getting to this sort of like between 20 to 30 years, things start to cycle back. but it's really kind of hard to predict. And then there are things that we could never predict, like the, the face masks becoming <laughs> such an integral part of our everyday dress. Um, so it, it, it's, it's interesting. There's also this other uh, approach that people have said, you know, fashion is about evolution, not revolution. So we, we see waistlines, for example. They go up as high as they can and when the waistline can't go up any higher it has to drop back down again and in the early 2000s when the waistlines on denim got so low like they couldn't go any lower without becoming indecent and then they had to come back up again and so there is this kind of movement right of design lines that kind of push to an extreme and then come back again um, but the timing of it is very hard to predict um, so many other social, cultural, economic forces are at play, uh, even when we think about materials, like in the United States, trade policy right, is going to determine, 
you know, what kinds of fibers and, uh, and where things are manufactured. And so there's a lot of other uh, variables that are influencing what gets made, how, it's get, how it gets made, and, and whatnot. Professor Green, thank you very much. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you all for having me, and thank you for being such a wonderful, attentive audience. It's an honor to share the, the morning and early afternoon with all of you.